if there then is what our brain does when we're looking for this real success in life, which is a deep connection with something higher. And our brain says we will be happy if the conditions change when we get there in space or then in time. And so we're constantly projecting out what we think will make us feel whole, feel okay, uh, when you can have that now. And that's on the other side of the sword. Welcome to You're Allowed to Hate Your Husband, a modern day love story. I am Remy Stern. I'm a relationship coach, and we are going to talk all things relationships, from being single to dating to being engaged, married. Who you marry is the most important decision you will ever make. If you're looking for a wife, which is a beautiful thing to do, the best thing to do is to choose wisely. If you're thinking, what am I doing wrong? Everybody else has it right then you are in the right place because trust me, nobody knows what they're doing. I'm so excited. Please hop right in, listen to this episode, listen to this series, and we are so excited that you are joining us here. Okay, guys, welcome back to your Allowed to Hate Your Husband. Today's episode is so incredibly special. It is an author and a rabbi who I admire deeply and I'm like on a high right now after this conversation so I'm so excited for you guys to listen. Moshe Gersht, he has written two best-selling books. He is incredible. Please hop in. I can't even describe how much you're going to get from this episode no matter where you're at in life. This is an episode for you to change your life so hop right in and enjoy. Not only did we have the most interesting conversation already off camera but New York City just had an earthquake so so we're like living in a different universe right now, right. but I'm so excited. I have to admit, I'm a little starstruck. This is like the starstruck I get because I've read your books and I, I have a beautiful memory of reading your first book. And you'll tell everyone about your books. During COVID, sitting on the beach, I had just started my life coaching business and like I was in the flow. <laughs> I was just feeling all the things. And I would love to remember where I found your book, but it just like everything stuck. I have this memory for things that are important that just they stick in there. So hopefully we can go through so much today because I have a lot to talk about. But thank you for being here. Will you just, you know, tell everyone who you are, um, what you do, a little bit about maybe how you got here. So first of all, thank you so much for having me. And uh, even though the earthquake happened, we didn't feel it. So we really are living in this other zone right now. So that's good. No, it's crazy. We were talking and my whole building was like, the, our, the things on our walls were shaking our, and you and I are talking and like, I literally feel like I'm like the world's shaking when I have these deep, amazing conversations that like, I don't know, it's wild, but it, crazy stuff happening. So, so tell us a little bit about you, who you are for the people who don't know you, even though a lot of my followers and listeners and community do know you. So my name is Moshe Gersht. Uh, I'm originally from LA, which I now understand you are also. So it's like, we understand what the West coast looks like, which is very different than the East. Uh, and I spent mo like not most, I think I spent every waking day of my teenage years, uh, involved with music. Uh, that was my life. Uh, I started around 12 and I went through 20 being the singer songwriter of a rock band, uh, which was an amazing experience. Uh, we signed a record deal when I was around 18, my family moved to Israel. I decided to pursue the music life over here and things were really good. That transitioned into thinking deeper about life at some point. I, I don't know how often I speak about it, but really what happened, what started the, the journey and the train inward was one of my band members uh, got addicted to methamphetamines. And it was like wow. a really dark time. Uh, I, I mean, everybody in that scene was, was doing lots of stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, but this was really bad. He stopped showing up for concerts. He stopped showing up for practice. It was, what, what are we going to do? And then at some point we had this big meeting where the CEO of the label, the president of the label, everybody sat, the, all the other band members, my manager, everybody sat down at this big long table and said, look, we all came together and made the decision that we're ready to, you know, kick him out of the band. But since you're, it, this is your band, you know, you have to make that decision. We're not going to, you know, pull a friend away from you in your life. But just so you know, we think that that, uh, if, you, if you keep him in the band, your chances of success are like, you know, dismal which was like a really heavy thing to hear when you've invested years and years into something. Uh, that sent me on 
a trip to get perspective. I went to go visit my family. And on that trip, I started thinking a little bit deeper about life. I did go in more inward. When I got back, I made the decision that we were going to separate from him, which was up there, like probably top five most difficult conversations I've ever had to have. But I was so all in. And the timing is uh, cosmically strange because within six weeks or seven weeks of that conversation, we had the album release party. And at that party was when this guy came up to me and he asked me, how long was I going to be involved in music for? And I said, I don't, I don't know what you mean. Like, uh, this is what we do. And he said, uh, well, what, how, until when are you going to do this? And I said, I guess until we're successful and then we'll settle down. And he said, when's that? I said, when's what? And he said, when's success? And at the time I told him to grab another drink because mm-hmm. he was ruining my buzz. <laughs> and, uh, but I woke up the next morning and that question burned in me like a fever. I couldn't really shake it. Months and months thinking about when is success? What does success really look like? And the short version is uh, I came to the conclusion that you can be successful at what you do and still fail at life. Uh, That was a really hard thing to come to a realization when you've invested your life into something. But I think a wise person knows to walk away from something, even if you've put a lot of time into it, if it's taking you in the wrong direction for your life. And so I did. I made the decision to leave. I ended up going to Jerusalem. and I fell in love with a whole new life. I was like laughing and crying on the flight, on the mm-hmm. way there, laughing from the freedom, crying from, you know, it's, it, was, it was still hard. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so that, and that, that was the beginning of really a spiritual journey, which I've been on for the last 17 years. One thing about that, and, and it's a, something that I contemplate a lot, is there really in our culture, it's this idea of like this shiny object that we are all chasing. And it's almost as if you're never going to get that shiny object, especially if you're chasing it. It's that like constant chase. Um, And I spoke to someone yesterday who like to anyone on the streets would be like, you made it. Like you made it. She's huge in the industry. This girl created this unbelievable thing. And she's like, I've never been so lonely. It makes me think of a Justin Bieber song that my daughter loves. It's like about him being lonely. He's like, yes, I made it. I'm famous. Everyone knows my name, but why is nobody checking on me and asking how I'm doing? And you know, and, and we, we are all on this chase for something. You know, we, I talk to a lot of people looking for relationships or, and I always crack up because I'm like, yeah, you're, you're single. You're going to find your relationship. Trust me, you all will. Marriage is no walk in the park, everybody. Like, you're going to get there and have a whole new set of challenges. Of course, with the right tools and the right steps, it's all so, single is beautiful. Marriage is beautiful. Being a rock star is awesome. Being a rabbi is amazing. Like, all of this is amazing, but if you're constantly chasing this shiny object of success that the bar just keeps rising, keeps rising, you're never going to meet it. It's it's not a fulfilling life, and I think you've from your books you've experienced that at di- different points. Even as a spiritual leader, mm-hmm. there was a point that you you felt empty too. So how did you like now really discover what it means to actually be living that successful life, that fulfilled life? Yeah. So two two points on that. One is just this idea of like constantly following and chasing the shiny thing. Uh, So there's an idea in Torah that describes uh, in the Garden of Eden. So there's the tree of life, which we we did not have the opportunity to have. We ate from the tree of good and evil, right? And so that starts the world in a different trajectory. But there's this other tree and the tree is the metaphor of something that gives life and um, it's a state of alignment. And that experience is hidden behind a fiery spinning sword is what the the verse says. The verse says there is a a spinning sword that is on fire that blocks us from this light. And the idea there is exactly this. It looks like the light. It looks like the life you're looking for, and it's constantly keeping you spinning. And that's the weapon. That's why it's a sword. The sword is a weapon. And the, the essential weapon of reality to keep us from that deeper state of alignment is look over here, look over there, stay distracted, new, interesting, exciting, right? And that's where I think I'm going to find my happiness. Like the, and it's all the same to me. We speak about the if there then distortion. Right? You're going to have to, it, that book I read a while ago and I'm going to remember a lot from it, but the three conditions is more top of mind. So remind me what the if. If, if there then is what our brain does when we're looking for this real success in life, which is a deep connection with something higher. 
And our brain says we will be happy if the conditions change when we get there in yep. space or then in time. And so we're constantly projecting out what we think will make us feel whole, feel okay, uh, when you can have that now. And that's on the other side of the sword. Right? Oh my so. gosh, I'm obsessed with that. And in a way that I think about this and I think it fits in, and um, we just had an amazing conversation of this actually happening in your life. But the idea of I will feel this way that I want to feel if and when this happens, right? So let's say, for example, with a relationship, like when I meet somebody, I will feel happy and fulfilled and excited by life. But until then, I don't feel those things. Until then, I'm waiting to feel those things. So I say we too often live our lives by doing, once I have this thing, I'm going to do all the things I want to do and I'm going to be the way I want to be. I say flip that equation around, be who you want to be, do all the things that you want to do, show up, go travel, go take yourself to dinners, go do the things you want to do, be the person, be happy, be fulfilled, be these things. And I guarantee you, not only will you have the physical form, but that's really what you're looking for. And I know in three conditions you talk a lot about, and I think it's, you know, in culture, now we call it manifestation maybe, but it's, it's this idea of like becoming that version of yourself who has it. Like you talk, you say it like almost like a child playing make-believe, right? So when, when you're talking about that, like, how do you instruct a person to embody this version of themselves and be, be that version now? Yeah. Like, and like you were saying, it's really, it's flipping the script, right? Where normally we think we'll get it there and then, and then we'll feel this thing where instead of living for joy, live from joy. Ooh, explain. Right? Instead of, meaning we live for things that are out there, but mm-hmm. you can walk towards the thing you want from that mm-hmm. place. I mean, you can already be there and still walk in the direction of everything you're looking for. And you get two things. Number one, you already get the outcome that you desired, which was the experience. It's the inner state that you really want from whatever it is you think you're going to have. I had a conversation the other day who, uh, with a great guy, like uh, whatever, a, a businessman here in Manhattan. Mm-hmm. And he said, that his goal is to be a billionaire. Like he has this 10-year goal. That's what he wants to do. He's doing a good job. (laughs) Yes, he is. If I know what this is. And and, and, and he's working, a a different guy. Oh, no. (laughs) Yeah, another guy. I was like, I'm pretty sure he might be there. Yeah, yeah, no, no. Manhattan, yeah, yeah. Manhattan is uh, filled with with guys like that. Yes, (laughs) it is. And women. And by the way, we're all chasing the shiny thing. They get the 100 million. Guess what they want next? That's right. The billion, which is okay. You should always strive for more. So I I asked him, I said, why do you want that? And he said, what do you mean? That's, that's, my, that's my dream. That's my goal. That's my desire. I said, but why is that your desire? Uh, and it took a few back and forth before we got to, then I'll have financial freedom. And I said, and why do you want that? And when you break everything down, it comes back to some version of, because then I'll feel okay. Mm-hmm. Then I'll feel good. I said, and what would happen if you felt that now? Mm-hmm. Like, like would, would it really destroy your life? Or you would, you would then be able to experience what you think you'll get from that prize. If you can get that now, you're right. You might or might not get to a billion. That might or might not happen. But if you feel okay, you'll probably spend more time with your wife and kids. You'll probably spend more time doing the things that are important for you along the way because you're not so narrow-sighted on a specific goal that you don't even really know why you want it. It's just some feeling that you're looking for. And that's what we're looking for in this world. It's unbelievable. And it, I think most every single person needs to understand this concept. Like It is the most mind-blowing concept. And there's a story, um, I'm pretty sure it's in Judaism about the fisherman. Do you know this one who like has a cute little fisher? Yeah. So it's the idea. I mean, you probably know it better than I do. If, if, do you know what I'm talking about? No, no, no. I, I, th- I think, but I so want to hear a, from you. So there's a fisherman with his wife. They have a lovely life and he catches a few fish, you know, a day, a month, and then he goes and sells them. And then he gets to hang out with his wife and he's got a really lovely little thing and a beautiful fish town. And this big mis- businessman comes and says, you know, you can turn this little fisherman business you have into a really big business. Like I looked and there's so many fish here and you can really start, you know, expanding this and selling so many fish. And the fisherman's like, okay, that's great. But like, why would I want to do that? You can make so much money and you'd have this huge business and you'd have employees and it would work great. Okay. So like, why would I want to do that? Then you'd make more money. Okay. So why do I want to do that? Then you can go on these trips. Why would I want to do that? So you can spend time with your family on these beautiful trips. He says, I'm doing that right now. I definitely botched the story horribly, but I'm doing that now. You know, I'm sitting with my two fish a day and I'm spending time with my loved ones. And it's okay to have these big goals. Like, listen, I do. I really do. Like, I want to help so many people. I have this desire. And I think with 
the words that we use. I really think Hashem planted a desire into me because he wants to fulfill it. And I know you talk about this concept. I'm getting this straight from you. So I'm not taking credit for this, but you know, Hashem plants these or the universe, whatever words someone likes to use, plants these desires in you for a reason. And the universe Hashem wants to give that to you. And it might be a matter of time. So between now and when you get your so-called thing you want to do, what are you going to do in the middle? How are you going to feel? How are you going to fulfill your time? So you're saying that what if you go from this place, not to it, not for it, but from it? Do you have a way that like people can actually apply that to their lives and start to live from that space of wholeness and fullness and being okay? I think the easiest thing we can do, maybe there's nothing easy about this, but it's just, it's simple. It's simple, not easy. We've trained ourselves to have opinions in reality. And no one's told us not to. So of course, that's what we do. Everyone around us has opinions, thoughts, beliefs on everything that's taking place in our life. Whether you're using the word should or supposed to, or um, I need this to happen, it, I have to, have to, should, need, supposed to, all of those languages, which is not about the words, but about the energy that they feel, is that if you can notice how often you're doing that and see that's really the source of my pain now, you see, the problem we think we have is never the problem, right? It's our thought about whatever situation we're in that is the problem. Uh, on some level, you can mm-hmm. say that there really are no problems. There are situations and interpretations. Mm-hmm. That's what there are. Like things show up and now we interpret life a certain way. So in this case, you have a certain goal and there's a distance between here and that thing. And we say it, there's a problem because I'm far from it. Well, it's not a problem. There's just a situation. There's what you want to get and there's where you are. And that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. But to the degree that you need it to happen for your happiness. It's the, it's the sense of need, which falls into the entire world of should and supposed to, and I have to. And becoming aware of your inner dialogue, that's the first step. And for some, that's the last step. If you realize, wow, I'm doing this. Like that's a mantra I've been sharing with a lot of my clients recently, which is don't, don't point the finger at everything in your life. If you're feeling a certain way, you know, someone once said that wherever you point the finger is where the power is. So if you're pointing outward, so that's what has the power. So I'm, I'm doing this, right? meaning I'm the one cre- perpetuating the thought about this. What if I thought something instead, which isn't easy, right? So it, sometimes you can't go from one thought to a new thought, but you can go to the place in the middle, the quiet in between. And so that's really, for me, that's the first step is cultivating an awareness and finding a place of stillness. And then from there, we can talk about reorienting the type of belief or the type of thought we want to have in this world to move in that direction. Oh my God, that's so brilliant. And it's so true. And another thing you say, I'm going to quote you over and and I'm not going to say it as well as you do, but the concept of life is happening for me, not to me. And my life coach, who I've spoken about a million times and is my life, I'll have a life coach forever. You happen to know her very well. And it's probably one of the biggest lessons that I've had in my life was, and I, I caught you up on my story a little bit before this with my parents' divorce. And I sat here and I was like, woe is me. My life is terrible. And how did, how did Hashem do this to me? How did I, and I didn't have those words at the time, but how did I end up in this? And because of this, oh, I'm going to have a horrible marriage because I don't know what a good marriage looks like. And even though my parents really did have a beautiful marriage, thank God when they did, but I had this narrative of a hardship and a challenge and a this that happened to me. And my life coach says, no, 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 honey. (laughs) Like, do you see where you're at in life now? You're on this incredible search for what it means to live a fulfilled life. You not only that, but because of that, you met an amazing husband. You're now in an amazing marriage with a daughter who you are going to give the world to. Not only that, you're helping other people do it. Like question your life now. Would you would you change anything about it? I said, no, you know, maybe, but like, I love what I've created. She was, then you're not going to press delete on any of those hardships that have happened to you because they got you to where you are now. And it just gives you a different way of looking at your life to be like, life is not happening to me. It's happening for me. And nothing is, you know, everything's really neutral in the end of the day, as hard as that is for people to apply it to their life, including me. I, I'm going through a, a challenge per se right now, but I have to say with my life coach's help and the tools that I have, I genuinely, and it's a big challenge in my family and my world right now that, and it's okay. It's, it's, but like, 
I so see it, not clearly, I see it open. Like I'm open to possibilities of Hashem being like, yeah, I'm taking away a lot from you right now. I'm taking away this because I have something so much better for you on the other side. So relax. Like, come with it. Like, relax. It's all good. <laughs> That's what my nanny would say. Like, <laughs> it's all good. And to trust and to let go and to say that, like, I'm going to be open to whatever I'm going through right now. Like, it just opens you up for possibilities, wouldn't you say? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this that type of framework of going through life, uh, the way I think about it is you, you're trying to lower expectations on what is supposed to happen and raise your assumption that things are always working out. And if you can do that when you meet in between, because it's really just our projections onto reality, our expectations are what's keeping us in the dark, right? They're keeping us in the in the pain point. So if you say, and that works backwards also. So mm-hmm. if you say, I, you should, life should have gone differently. I wish my parents didn't do this. I wish I had this kind of life. So that type of thought is actually keeping you here. And the other assumption, right, which is that things are working out, you, you wind up walking away with three things. Either things work out the way you want to, and you're grateful and appreciative. Uh, and because you had low expectations, you actually feel into it. Uh, or it doesn't work out the way you want it to. And it you can see it as either this is it's better for me that it doesn't happen. It's not happening yet, or it's for my personal evolution, right? So those are the only options, but you can still stay in the state of like, things are okay. Like the life is so much bigger than this one experience or this one problem that you have. It's the, it's the bigger picture. It's going really general with perspective. So why do you think, because it's, it's a default for people to go to the negative, honestly, and it's such a bummer. And I've been totally, you know, I've, guilty of this, where I immediately think like the worst case scenario of how it's going to work out or why this is tough on me. And like it maybe, and I'm all for therapy, you know, I think I'm a life coach, obviously. So I believe in a space to be able to talk about things and to make things better. I think that if you focus on the negative, you're only going to get more of what you focus on. You're going to focus on where you point your finger, as you said. Um, So I do a lot of work and I'm sure you do as well of getting people to really start to see the positive. And if you can think worst case scenario, oh boy, can you think best case scenario for sure? And that's where you'll be headed. But like, what is it that we default to just thinking about the negative? Why why are we so addicted to that? (laughs) We're afraid. Okay. Uh, Behind the whole experience of life is this feeling of being separate. That's the natural state of... of a material of the material in in the world of material things are all separate one from the other and if you think that that's reality which we're raised to believe that both from our parents society and our senses right we sense things as all being separate uh, that means that i'm also separate and far from everything that i want separate from the idea of a higher power separate from my own self maybe separate from uh, from everything right there's a, there's this feeling of separateness and in separateness um comes a, a feeling of weakness and fear that, well, then anything can happen. I can be taken away. Meaning I, that can be taken from me and I can be taken from, from everything and everyone. And, and so there's this underlying, we call it the ego, right? And the ego is this feeling of I'm separate from everything and I need something out there to change for me to be okay because I'm not whole as it is. So if that's our underlying premise for reality, so the default is negative because the default is fear. So we live in this fear and desire with everything in our lives. And it's only when you go all the way in and make that flip that you can start to default in the other direction. Wow. I mean, it's a huge concept because you're going all the way to fear of like all aspects of life. And I think we're, I think we are a little addicted to fear people and, and thinking worst case scenario and thinking that if we focus on the fear, the fear won't happen. I actually find there's, you know, faith over fear concept. Mm -hmm. And it's the idea of like, you know, when I was pregnant, like a lot of people were like, don't buy the furniture for the baby. There's like weird little things like that. Don't have a baby shower because then you're celebrating something that hasn't happened. And I found that what works for me and whatever works for everybody, but to focus on faith over fear, because if I feed the fear, I not very enjoyable for me. And I don't know, it just energetically feels, feels off. But if you're sitting in the place of faith, and I feel like faith goes with like love and gratitude of whatever hap- is happening right now, whatever has happened, whatever is going to happen is for the best. And everything is one, you know, these are huge concepts, like overwhelmingly big concepts. I 
you know, soak them up. I just went to a Joe Dispenza retreat recently. I don't know if you know who he is. Um, It was amazing. And he talks a lot about how in the physical world, we see everything as separate, like you said. And me, to my experience over there, there's distance. You know, there's distance. And like, you have to go through time and space. And there's a lot of effort it takes to get to what you want. And what I get from you is that if you start to give yourself the feelings you're looking for, so get very clear, this amazing man who wants to be a billionaire and has a great plan for it. Wonderful. Let's talk when you get to a billion and see if you really feel that satisfaction. But what is it, like you said, that you want from those billion dollars? Like, what is it going to do for you? Can we, just as an experiment, as a test, start to fall in love with that billion dollars now? Like, you think about the thing, and this is very Joe Dispenza, and it, it has worked magic in my life, I have to say. Like, if I fall in love with the experience before the experience itself happens, not only is the present moment so much more spectacular than anything in the entire world. Like, I don't want to leave the present moment. I'm sitting there and I'm like, oh my God, I'm in. I, I say at the retreat, you know, when you felt like when you fall in love with your person and just the world is brighter. And I, I like, that was so fun when you, when Jonathan and I first met and everything was happy and bright, you know, of course now, now we love each other even more every single day, of course, but it's different. Um, and everything just like looks happy and bright and you don't really need to sleep because you have so much energy and you don't even need to eat because you have so much joy and love. When you fall in love with the present moment, that's how I, that's how I felt at least in, in that moment. So for you, when you give people this huge concept, because we're talking like big things right now, are there ways that you tell them to actually apply it to their lives? Because we know what Joe Dispenza says, like, are, do you have ways that you're like, okay, this is how you you give yourself these feelings now. This is how you don't feel separate. This is how you fall in love with the present moment. What does that look like for you? So first of all, love all of that. Beautifully <laughs> said. Thank you. Uh, and I think about that all the time. I feel like part of the calling and what I'm doing is trying to help people fall in love with life. Like life, life is good. Uh, and I know, I know the natural inclination is to point at all the things that aren't okay. And even when I speak about all the things that are good, people will say, but what about the bad? Mm-hmm. I Meaning, like that is the natural inclination. Mm-hmm. But we have to remember, we are, we're on a rock floating through space and there's an atmosphere and there's gravity and you can see and taste and smell and taste and touch. And you, you, there's a, a, an incredible infinite amount of experiences that can happen, which by the way, we're also, you were born, like you made it through. So just the, the premise to, to really, yeah, the whole thing is a miracle. Like to begin with, the context of all struggle is it shouldn't even be here anyway. Like nothing needs to happen. So you're here. So you made it. So that's really, really great. That's a wonderful, wonderful thing. Uh, and if you can- emotional, it's so cute. And we just had an earthquake. So now I'm thinking about like the earth and like, it's crazy. It's amazing. And look, I'm saying, would you do want to live on Mars? I'm saying like the, all the so. other rocks, all the <laughs> other rocks around here aren't as beautiful and nice as this. You can go outside and see a tree, a tree. I know people look at me like I'm nuts. Like, no, it's true. But it's, it's amazing. The world is so abundant. It's all there and you're still breathing. And there's the, the metaphor that I think about is like you person saves up a lot of money. They invest in a new car. They're really excited about it. And then someone comes and like, you know, scratches mm-hmm. the back with a key. And that will become the entire focus of your attention for certainly hours, days, maybe weeks, depending on the car, maybe wow. months. Because right? I'm already like annoyed by that scratch. Like I'm just... Just imagining like it. Annoyed. I'm like, get that. And I'm not even like an OCD type of person. <laughs> like, right. It's true. Or, but you or, have the car. Yeah. And the entire yeah. interior and the engine. I mean, it all works perfectly. And you're right. There are things about life that that are painful, like physical pain. And there's emotional pain. Those are real things. But just we have to remember the context. So to your point of like practical kind of like, how, how do we help move in? So in my mind, uh, what I like to share with people is you know, the word for mother in Hebrew is ima. And uh, E-M-A are kind of like an easy way to remember the fact that if you have daily education, meditation, and appreciation, uh, you will start to change the lens on your life. Uh, It's very, very difficult in the beginning of somebody's journey to 
figure out trajectory, if they're not taking in ideas from a person like Joe Dispenza or from any other work that inspires you. So we, in the beginning, it's like we need to become re-inspired with reality. Of course, there are many paths, but education is like right there at the top. That's why there's such an emphasis in the world of Torah on learning and, and studying and education. Why? Because when you do that, you are reprogramming your brain. And ideally, if you do that first thing in the morning, like your, your brain is so ready to, it's like a sponge to take in new perspective and new ideas. So the very first thing is education. Um, and I think it's the easiest beginning point for people because not everybody's there yet for meditation in like a deep way, but you, but you can. Uh, then that second step is when, when you can integrate meditation into your life, it's a different life. That's one of the things that I, I don't think there's a replacement for. Mm -hmm. uh, finding time to get quiet and learn to see without judging what's happening. It's that non-judgmental objective awareness of your thoughts and your feelings and your body and your surroundings and what's what you're hearing. Really being open and allowing everything to be as it is without needing to change it. That's a skill that feels, it, it's not just it feels good in those 15 minutes or half an hour that you decide to meditate. That's really developing a muscle of allowing. It's a muscle of surrender. Like, oh yeah, this is happening and that's happening and this is happening. And you don't have to take my word for it. Anybody who's ever gone into the world of meditation knows that stillness and that peace that comes through, that's just your natural state. You just pulled your attention out from all the things that it had stuck its tentacles in. And so it's like, oh, I'm going to pull it all back and be living on the inside. And then that third piece is appreciation. There's nothing, there's nothing like appreciation. Because yeah. well, the word appreciate means to expand, right? When if you're investment appreciates it, it got more so to to have gratitude means to make more out of the things that you already have right to really really expand all of the the goodness that's already there and it like you said this moment is so full right it's, it's so cool I, I mean what you appreciate appreciates like the so maybe cheesy things out there but they're so true like if you start to focus on things with appreciation rather than lack that thing is, first of all, the universe just wants to give you more and more of what you appreciate. I think of a, of a way of thinking about it, which is being a grateful guest on this planet of earth. Like let's say you opened your home to a guest and the guest comes in and the guest is moping around and you gave them a bed to sleep in and pajamas and shoes. And you gave them all this stuff and they're like, oh, this isn't enough. And it's not comfy enough and blah, blah, blah. Like, would you want to give that guest more? No. But if the guest comes in and goes, thank you so much for these pajamas. Like they are the warmest, coziest pajamas ever. Thank you. Thank you. And they're dancing and they're singing and enjoying your home. You want to bring them so much more. Like to be a grateful guest not only feels good, but it puts you into the state of abundance. And I love all of that. And my biggest thing in the entire world, like I'm so excited right now. Like I, I feel like there's like energetic earthquakes right now just by everything you're saying. And my biggest thing, um, my program is actually called Feel Love Now, which mm. is all about falling in love with Oh, the moment. That's and awesome. My next book is supposed to be called Feel Good Now. So no. Sorry. Hello. Yeah. <laughs> feel love now. Feel good now. I love that. So I actually, I, this is now, I'm, I guess my brain's hopping to the negative, but it's not because they're going to pull the positive. Um, I remember you had an acronym for fear because we're talking about like, okay, learning, meditation, appreciation, all amazing for feeling the best. And then our brain reverts back to fear. It was something with F E A. False evidence appearing real. Oh, I can't remember. I love that. Yeah, I, I can't remember now. where I first heard that. That I didn't come up with it, but it was so poignant and so real and so true. Which is, that's what we do. We we take false evidence and we say, oh, that's this is reality, and we we fall into fear. We keep going back into it. Uh, there's a, another quote that I quote from a Course in Miracles that says, uh, "That which is real can never be threatened. That which is unreal doesn't exist." And herein lies the peace of God. That, that's how you get out of fear is by figuring out, well, what is real and what is unreal? Because if it's real, nothing can happen to it. And if it's unreal, it's not really there anyway. And if you can get into that space and see that for what it is, you find the peace within. Mm -hmm. You don't need it anymore. And the fear is, the, is seeing the unreal and thinking that it is real. It's so crazy. We live so often. And again, I have the tools, thank God, and I... And I really do practice what I preach. And I feel very grateful and lucky that I have this basis. But I fall victim to, to these things in the world where too often we are living in the future and we're coming up with worst case scenario and making up some fake 
frou-frou world that probably won't even happen. We come up with a story that's not, probably not going to happen and we ruin the present moment about, from it. Or we think about the past. And I think I, there's a stat that's like 80% of our memories are actually stories that we came up with. Like we will come up with a story Whoa. around, is it, it's actually in Joe Dispenza somewhere in there, but like we're living off this false story from the past and we're living on a not true story in the future. And we're unfortunately ruining the present moment because of that, where we are seeing that there is so much magic and beauty to the present moment that we don't give enough attention to. And when you do that, things unfold in an unbelievable way. I want to, I have to touch on the story that you told me off camera before this of the fact that when you do this work, it might take time. There's an amount of patience that needs to be had. And this goes to anything you're looking for in your life. You know, if it's a relationship, let's say you're looking for a relationship. And so often we say, I want it right now. I'm sick of it. I've been on X amount of dates. I'm done. I want it right now. And I say, okay, you, the relationship for the rest of your life, God willing, you want one relationship. Trust me. You don't want to get divorced. It's, <laughs> what's on the other side of divorce is not better than the issues. Like you want one person. Okay. And you want that one person right now. But what if the right person was in two weeks, three months, 12 months, 24 months, like you can wait 24 months if it's the right person for the rest of your life. This also goes for business stuff. Let's say like, I obviously have huge ambitions and sometimes I want it right now. Sometimes like I want to see the thing unfold, but it's kind of like watching my daughter. Like right now she's, she's the easiest. Thank God. Thank God. Thank God. Best child ever. Um, Love her. (laughs) Best child in my life ever. (laughs) And she's having a little moment. She's turning two very soon where she's frustrated by things. Like she, she can't say what she wants. So she'll get, she's having a little bit of terrible twos. Not really, but I'm seeing an inch of it. And my life coach said, let her go through this phase. Like she has to go through the phase. You have to go through each phase to get to the next thing. And sometimes we want to rush it. So you just had this amazing story that happened to you that took years (laughs) to come to fruition. Like How can you live when you don't see the life you want right now, when you don't see that partner, when you don't see the billion dollars, when you don't see the this now, how do you relax and know, like be patient and know that what's coming is better, but like patience, like it's, it's hard. It's hard. Uh, There's another line from the course that says with infinite patience comes immediate results. And that's really deep and really beautiful. Uh, And the idea of infinite patience, what does it mean to have infinite patience? It means to let go of needing anything to happen at any time. Life's happening. I have infinite patience, meaning every moment is exactly where I need to be. What are the immediate results that you get from that? You get the peace and the joy you were looking for in the other thing, right? So if if you just step into the now in a deep way with infinite patience, you get the immediate results of whatever it is you're trying to create in this world or manifest in this world. The, the way I like, I look at it like this, where if you need that thing that you want, whatever it is, the relationship, the money, the house, the car, whatever it is that you're looking to create in your life, if you need it now, you will have pain. If you're okay with it happening later, any amount of later, just not this moment, this moment can be okay. And if it happened in five minutes, that that's fine. That's later. It's not now. Um, You'll flip your entire life around. So long as you're okay with this moment as it is, this this moment is good, this moment is fine, you have the peace that you want, and you also have the direction of where you want to go. So it doesn't have to happen now if you're allowed to, if you can let go of it needing to happen in literally this moment. That's what now means. My brain is truly like, that's unbelievable. Keep right. All, yeah. All you have to do is, because, you know, a lot of people ask me, how, how do they fit the world of, let's say, like Eckhart Tolle type of mm-hmm. power of now mm-hmm. material with a more Esther Hicks of like manifesting and focusing on the future? And how do those two worlds fit together? And that, that's how it fits together, which is when you love now, you've created all the space to get to where you're going later. No one says don't have a goal or don't, don't point in a direction. Don't go somewhere. Of course, that's what we're doing here. Like it, you don't aimlessly walk around. Like when you're sitting at a table and you're having lunch. So if you, you can't just sit there and be present and say, the food will make it into my body. Mm-hmm. Like you have to take the fork Sean and you have to put it, <laughs> you put it in the food and you have to take it to your mouth. Like, of course we're going to do that. But it's, what are you 
experiencing while you're moving the fork? What are you experiencing while you're putting it into the food? What are you experiencing while it's coming to your mouth? That's what presence is. And so you continue to have vision, like you said, seeds being planted in you, calling you in the direction of something, right? We're all planted with seeds of callings. Uh, I think the, there's a difference between calling and purpose. You're always on purpose. Your calling is where you're going. So you're being called in the direction of something, but every step is on purpose. Every moment is, is, is alive and, and it's pregnant with the next moment. And so, so long as you can be allowed to be here with that openness of infinite patience, I don't need it right now. I would be okay if this happened in five minutes. I'll, I can be okay if this happened later. So later never comes. So it's okay if it's five minutes because even if it takes three years, you're just, you're walking in that direction and loving the process. So it's so funny. Life is so simple. I know it's not easy, but this is, this is all you have. (laughs) This is, meaning if you make a goal and it's a goal that's going to take you years to get to, or you may think it come today, but it ends up taking years to get to. You might not be able to change that part of the equation. All you can do is try to be in alignment as you're getting from here to there. That's it. That's the only thing you can do. And if you work really hard and you try to bring it into your present moment faster um, and it's motivated by fear, you'll feel that in the process and you'll feel that in the result. Oh my God, I'm mind blown. I'm actually, it's different obviously to read your books versus hearing it directly. So I'm so grateful. Thank you. And to say it that way of, I'm going to go along with relationships because obviously this is about relationships, but this is playing out in so many ways in my own life. So thank you. Um, Jonathan always says, you don't want Mr. Right now. You want Mr. Right. Like if you choose Mm. the best, like if you go on a date and you're like, okay, finally he's texting me again. I'm not being ghosted. And finally someone likes me and okay, perfect. I'm going to go with this one because it's Mr. Right now. Then I hope you sign this contract for a really, really long time. God willing, 80 years. Like go live with this person for a long time. You want Mr. Right. Like you want the best, best, best situation. So not only like be okay with waiting, I almost say like want to wait. Like say like, I actually like, I'm going to ask you to wait for the best, 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 best thing. And this can go for career. It can say like, you know, I actually don't want it right now because maybe right now isn't the exact thing. Like I want to wait for the best, best, best thing I'm going to fall in love with right now. And I'm arms open. Like I'm ready to receive and accept this thing. And it is truly mind blowing to think of it that way and to fall in love with the moment. Like my brain is going in all directions. I'm like, so, so, so grateful for this. So specifically to you, and if you don't mind me bringing it to you, but you just had this experience that took years And there would have been the option of right now. And you could have been so frustrated in the moment that it didn't happen right now for, what was it, five seconds? We said or five minutes of a chat on a call with someone who's very cool. I don't know if you're... So what you're talking about is um, this this week, we did the podcast with Gary Vaynerchuk. And it took years before that manifested into anything beyond an idea of doing some collaboration together. Uh, what had happened was maybe the the one foot version mm-hmm. is that the night of the release of my first book, it's all the same to me. Uh, he was doing a live and he invited people on if they had purchased some uh, package or something, some wine package. And we did. And I had this intuitive hit beforehand that he might do that. And so it was like, wow, this felt so in alignment. It felt so good. And I was hoping that I'd get 60 seconds to talk about my new book that came out and to say thank you for the help that he had given me along the way. And my name shows up on the screen. I'm about to get ready. And before you know it, the plug is pulled. He says goodbye to everyone. And I'm left there with a bunch of wine that I'm probably not going to drink. <laughs> you're not. Yeah. You know that. No, Gary, you're great. It's just not kosher. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I had to figure out what to do. And it took a few weeks of back and forth. Okay, we'll take care of it. We'll make sure you get your couple minutes. Like we'll you'll we'll set up something, and then eventually the the email stopped. The You're DM ghosted. stopped. I You're was ghosted. <laughs> I was ghosted. That's okay. <laughs> but not really. Uh, right. Not I was ghosted from from maybe people, but not from the universe, not from God. And it w- there was just this decision of like, okay, so we'll come back to this. Meaning we started something. It's not going anywhere. Uh, and there was just this decision to follow up, you know, once every month or two and send a message, an email or something. 
Uh, and it took 26 months before we got a reply saying, oh, right, we, yeah, remember that happened. Uh, look into that, see if it's legit. And that turned into a meeting that we got to have together, which he's great, wonderful human being, Very such cool beautiful energy. Uh, and then eventually that led to uh, being able to do this podcast with him uh, just recently. But from beginning to end of the idea of maybe we'd be able to start something or do some collaboration with him for those 60 seconds where I might have been able to speak about the book and to say thank you, it took years before we got there. And then at some point it dawned on me this like absolute clarity that it's, think about the conversation that I might have had, had I gotten what I thought I wanted right away. It, it, the conversation would have went like this. Thank you, Gary. I appreciate the fact that you put out content on social media. It was really helpful for me. And today I put out a book. It's really nice. It's like a nice thing. It's like cute. And we, it took years before we actually got on the call. And then the conversation went, hey, Gary, thank you so much for doing everything you do. You know, because of you, the book um, that I put out became a Wall Street Journal bestseller. Uh, we got endorsed by Deepak Chopra and a bunch of other amazing people. And that led to a TED Talk, which now has over a million views. And then after that, we got this publishing deal with the number one spiritual publishing house in the world. And uh, anyway, I'm so grateful. And so that's a completely different way to say thank you, which led to a follow-up of, hey, you know, maybe we can do the podcast together. And so if you get what you want up front, you might be losing what you actually want in, in the big picture. Uh, and it's okay. So you let it go. I, I didn't know how that conversation was going to go. You never know how things are going to go. But it's keeping the open mind. It's keeping the open heart attached to nothing, open to everything. That type of perspective allows you to move in the direction of what you want. And sometimes things work out the way you want them to, which is nice. And if you don't have the expectations, you really feel grateful. Uh, and sometimes they take time and sometimes they don't. And other things show up instead. I'm so obsessed with that story and everything with it. And it's funny because Gary Vaynerchuk is actually a big part of my story and getting to where I am now. And there's two people. I remember I was much young, very young. And I went to this one guy, Sadhguru's speech. And I, he said these things. I, when I love something, I will never, ever, ever forget it. And I could go on and on about the things he said. And I was like, that is so cool. Okay, you just changed my life. Gary, I went to a speech of his in Boston at Hub, HubSpot, I think it was called. Yeah, HubSpot. And he made the speech. And I just remember that feeling kind of of the earthquake where like the, move, the room moves. You're like, you're changing something in my life. And I don't know what it is. But similar, and I, now I do what I do. And I think God make speeches in front of people. And I do things that I saw them do. And I was like, wow, I, I want to do something like that. So he was a big part of, you know, me wanting to. So it's so cool that that happened with you in, in that way. And you waited and you could have had Mr. Right Now, like you said, not Mr. Right Now, but the, the Right Now situation, which would have been five minutes cute. A few years goes by and now you are on his podcast and there might be other things like trickling out from that. And that is spectacular. So that patience is so important. The, the simplicity of life. Like I love this idea of being like, it's a little more lighthearted and simple than we, we think it is. You know, we make it so complicated and watching a kid, watching my daughter, just how simple she enjoys life. It is so magnificent and teaches you everything. And, you know, I kind of, I want to leave on this concept um, that I love because it also is very practical and it reminds me of my daughter a bit. Um, and there's two parts to it. So if you don't mind, I'm just going to put the two parts and I, I want to hear in your words because they're so unbelievable. Um, the first one that I love, I think you, you talk about a proverb. I think that's how you call it, but, um, about how when a man looks into the, in a reflection in water, he sees himself and same goes for the heart. Like you the world is reflecting what's inside of us. The way I think about it and very like easy to understand simple terms is you don't get what you want, you get what you are. So the world is going to reflect back to you what you are. And that's why this internal work and showing up and doing, you know, it's so important because you get what you are. So go inside and start to look at who you are. Um, and then I think the follow-up to that and what I do a lot with my clients and feel of now and all of my work is um, walk as that person, talk as that person, like literally play. And it's, it's not, it's not fake it till you make it necessarily, even though there is some truth to that <laughs> for sure. But, but it's make believe like my daughter, she's so cute right there. She's got her little like makeup. It's not even real makeup, but she's putting it on my lips because she sees me do it. Like it's, it's this make believe. And when you do that, it comes into reality. And I just think that is such a 
fantastic way to live and make things. And it's happened to me, just one quick fun story. And then I want to turn it to you. I, um, I was making a speech at this rabbi's class. who's amazing. We had him on a few weeks ago. Um, millennial rabbi is his mm-hmm. name. <laughs> yeah, and yes, he's great. So he, he asked me to come in a good amount of time and speak. And, and one day he did. And I, I, it was a busy week and I was doing things for my daughter and I was running around and, and I had thought about it, but I hadn't given that much thought to the speech that night. I was like, oh my gosh, the speech is tonight. Okay. I like to sit. I like to close my eyes in my meditation, say, dear Hashem, what would you like me to say today to like move the people? And as I was doing that, I was just imagining Joe Dispenza style being in a room with all the people who I admire, people who I admire in the field and like I look up to. And I was like, okay, imagine if I was even like this person or they were just next to me. And I would like, think so big, even though this room of people is already big. And the craziest thing happened. I walked in, it was a class. There's usually 20, 40, 50, maybe a hundred people in this class. It's amazing, amazing people. I've met the most incredible people. Never has this ever happened. I don't know. Do you know who Gabby Bernstein is? Yeah, sure. Gabby Bernstein, this Robin who was on our podcast recently, like all of these people who I I admire so much in the field were sitting there listening to me speak (laughs) and I'm speaking next to them and in front of them. And, and Gabby Bernstein, who's huge for me, like came up to me afterwards and said, you did amazing. And we exchanged information and hopefully one day, God willing, Gabby will, we've talked about having her on, um, manifesting that. (laughs) So, so it really just, when you take yourself to that next level and become the version of yourself who you want to be, you unfold so much in your life. And this walking manifestation of like doing outside, I want to turn it to you just because I could talk forever. First of all, that's a great story. And (laughs) I love it. And I think, you know, the big takeaway from that and anybody who's listening, you know, is obviously in alignment with you and your frequency and this messaging. It's everything is possible. There's infinite possibilities that are there. And it's when we step into it that we open ourselves up to some of the things that could happen for us. And the the world is beautiful. And when it unfolds that way, it might not have happened that way. You could have showed up and Gabby's not there. But the fact that you show up and it does, it's like, those are the winks, right? A wink from God, a (laughs) wink from reality saying, you know, this is good. This, you're in the right track. It's less about what happens, more about what it means in your life. Uh, similar, by the way, similar but different. But when I was recently speaking in LA and like we mentioned before, so I used to be in a rock band. Uh, one of my favorite bands growing up was Linkin Park. They were the first concert that I'd ever gone to. And I was giving a talk somewhere and someone pointed out to me that uh, Brad Delson, the guitar player from Linkin Park, was there at my talk. And I thought that was like the cool, the coolest thing in the world, right? 20 years later, to be on the other side of that experience where you've been so impactful in my life and that you'd be sitting there listening to anything I have to say. That's amazing. And uh, and now we have a great relationship. He's just an amazing, amazing guy. Very like cool. so, so cool. Uh, those things happen when you're in alignment, when you are plugging in. You use the words fake it till you make it. I like to use the words, you know, feel it till you reel it. Um, Love that. Love because that. that's what you're doing. You're just trying to feel it and, and until it's reality. And you, that's what make-believe is, right? And I also have these young kids yeah. at home. And uh, when they're playing Superman, they are Superman. Yeah. Like they are. Yeah. Um, and you never know. And like when they play buried treasure, like they find money. Yeah, <laughs> like, you know, yeah, they're, yeah. they're playing it and then things happen and things show up in their lives. So uh, that's what we're doing here. We're, we are playing make-believe, right? That's the gift of life is, okay, well, what, what, what are you going to dream up next? Uh, enjoy the process because that's the gift. Unbelievable. And I think I have to leave it there because that is way too powerful. Unless you want to just give that one last piece of advice for people to fall in love. Like if you were to, in the elevator one second, someone's like, I'm so excited I get to meet you, but I'm running to a meeting. What is one thing that you'll give to me Mm. today? Like one piece of advice for everybody. Um, One piece of advice. I think maybe the, the line that comes to me is there's a, a line from the Baal Shem Tov, the founder of Hasidus. And he says, if a person wants to live with inner peace and love of life, they have to live with the following thought. I only have one moment in this world and that moment is right now. I love that so much. I just ended my, my grandma always had in her house. Um, Tomorrow is a mystery. Yesterday is history. Right now is the present or the present, something with the present moment. That's why they call it the present. 
it's something like that. You said it much better, but like, that's why it's called a present. Like you have right now. So really enjoy it. I love it so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm walking away as a different person, just so you know. And so I hope everybody else listening got as much as I did. So please just let us know where can they get more of this? Where, what are the names of your books? Where can they get them? Anything that everyone can get from you, please. Well, the newest book that's out now is The Three Conditions, How Intention, Joy, and Certainty Will Supercharge Your Life, which is available any, anywhere where books are, uh, ebook, uh, Audible, uh, Barnes & Nobles, Amazon, what, like physical copies, whatever you're looking for. And the same is true for It's All the Same to Me. Uh, yeah. And there's, I think there's some free downloads on the website at moshegersh.com. So if people want to get a taste of it before diving in, there's some freebies over there. Guys, they're fabulous books. They've changed my life. So go get them. Thank you so much, Moshe Rabbi. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. We hope you liked it as much as we did. Now go send it to someone who needs to hear it because we know that dating, relationships, marriage can be tough. But we want to make it less tough. And remember, you're allowed to hate your husband. Whatever you're feeling is allowed. So go send it to a friend, to your sister, your brother, maybe your boyfriend, a husband. Whoever needs to hear this, send it to them. And while you're at it, click the follow button, click the review button. Always feel free to reach out if you have any questions. And we are so excited to see you in our next episode.